Hi and welcome to the Rivers Church YouTube page. We're so glad that you've joined us, whether from near or far. We'd love to have you join us in one of our services if you find yourself in the area of one of our locations. There, you can experience powerful worship, inspiring teaching, and great connection. So make sure to visit rivers.church for directions and more information on service times. For now, Pastor Andre will be teaching on how to embrace our true spiritual identity so that we can live in the true freedom God has for us. Let's be sure to lean in. I've been reading about an interesting group of people that is growing in the Houston area in America. In fact, there are 3,000 of them in that area. They're called Therians. And a Therian is someone who believes spiritually or mentally that they are an animal. They bark, they growl, they crawl on the floor, and they name themselves wolf or cat or whatever. And there's another group called the Furries. They even dress up like animals. They wear furry clothes, pin tails on themselves. And it's a whole phenomena where people identify as animals. How many of you know we're living in a world that is faced with a huge identity crisis of epic proportions. People do not know who they are. And uh, here's an interesting thing. What you believe you are is the way you will behave. That's why we say to our kids, don't we? You're not an animal, don't eat like that. Because identification leads to behavior. And the world has never had as many identity issues as it currently has. It's interesting that the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13 will be to do with identity. Don't you find that interesting? And that the devil will use identity to control people. Well, you know, I've discovered that because there's so much confusion today about sexual identity, about social identity, racial identity, cultural identity, I want to speak to you today, and I've entitled the message, Embracing Our True Spiritual Identity. Embracing our true spiritual identity. It's a huge issue that our world has never faced. People are asking, who am I? Why am I? Where am I? And here's the amazing thing. People are asking, who am I? Jesus says, I am. So, man, that's pretty arrogant. No, no, he's not arrogant. He fully knows who he is. You know why? Because his father told him, and he didn't receive it from information. He received it by divine revelation. When you get to know who you are by divine revelation, you'll be completely set free. And we must discover our true identity in Christ. Do you know that most people use material adornments to try and create an identity? It's a natural thing, and particularly when you're insecure, it comes from your childhood. You try and create a persona that will create acceptance. People like you and love you and follow you or whatever. And, uh, and people are doing this, particularly today, on social media. You, people who, you, know, you can change your face, you can make yourself, on social media, you can make yourself attractive, you can alter your cheekbones and everything, and then you can tell people where you're living. You know, you can, you can take a toilet seat and put it next to you with a picture of scenery and it looks like you're on an airplane, you know, off to Mauritius. No, you're not, you're just off to the loo. But it's because you're insecure and you're trying to create an identity so that those kind of people will be attracted to you. I remember when we were growing up, we, we, we were part of the whole hippie movement, grew our hair long bell bottoms and big belts with leather pouches on with tobacco in, you know, I'd flick open this pouch, it had a guy playing a flute on it, flick it open, there's tobacco in there, and I'd roll a cigarette with yellow cigarette papers and everybody would be like, then I'd flick my hair back and light it. <laughs> you know, you, we had the hippies and we had the straights, the, the, the hippies and the turned on, and, and we weren't one of them, we were one of them. And when a guy had a headband around his head, you know, with leather and, and he had the jeans and, and his hair was long, he was the genuine thing, you know, and we sought to be like him. You can laugh at it because today we've got goths who dress in black and they've got pieces of machinery everywhere and black clothing. And, and, and when you see them, they're like in their boots, you know, like, I'm one of those. There's a desperate attempt to create an identity. It's not wrong to wear fashion. Don't try and get your identity there. Because you'll spend your life chasing after the next latest thing and hope you're not left behind. Because you know what we're doing? We're trying to do what Adam and Eve did. 
Adam and Eve fell, so they felt naked. So they put on fig leaves. And we do exactly the same today. Versace. Armani. Louis Vuitton. <laughs> and we try and cover because we feel inadequate. No, no, you can wear Versace and Louis Vuitton and you can enjoy all the blessings, but don't use it to make identity. <laughs> Let me give you four myths about identity before we get into it this morning and I trust I'll get through it all. Number one, the first myth that we can take on is appearance equals identity. You see, when it comes to objects, an appearance is its identity. When you look at a spoon, a spoon is a spoon. A cup is a cup, but it's not the same with a person. You can project an image, but it's not actually you. So don't judge things by the appearance. It's a shallow way, and it's so easy. Second thing is possessions equals identity. A lot of people believe that what they own makes them. No, it doesn't. It's a shallow way of being. It's wealth, not character. And I mean, you know, wealth is great. Better to be rich than poor, amen? Better to have money to pay your bills than not. But it's not, it doesn't make you. Number three, here's another myth. Success equals identity. That's a myth. You can be very successful, but it doesn't make you. Because you can also fail. You can have an achievement or a position, but it doesn't give you character. You know, you can live in, 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 in a nice estate. People have got expensive houses, but you don't know the type of people they are. You just know they've achieved something. It's not their character. You don't know if they're good or bad. And here's the thing. If you lose your achievements or you lose your position, it means you're nothing. See, you can lose what you've worked for, then, you, then you're a nobody. And, and it's quite a challenge, you know. Even famous people have faced this. Some of you may remember the tennis player, Chris Everett, uh, around the time of uh, the great players like uh, John McEnroe and, and people like that. She, she's now retired, and she said this. After retiring from tennis, she was a multiple champion. She said, I had no idea who I was or what I could be away from tennis. I was depressed and afraid because so much of my life had been defined by being a tennis champion. I was completely lost. Winning made me feel like I was somebody. It made me feel pretty. It was like being hooked on a drug. I needed the wins, the applause, in order to have an identity. Scary. Here's the fourth myth. Race equals identity. You're not the color of your skin. Isn't that true? You're not better because you're white and you're not inferior because you're black. You're not better because you're black or inferior because you're white. That's not your identity. Didn't Martin Luther King make that statement all the time? You don't judge a person by the color of their skin because the real person is on the outside. And yet there's a massive drive today to go back to our roots. It's almost like we feel like we've lost something. Now your identity has got to be more than in a cultural identity. I think identity is beyond race. It's deeper than that. I was reading about this man, his name is Sadna Segedi. He's a former member of the European Parliament. You can read his name and pronounce it yourself if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to pronounce it since last week. He was a member of the Hungarian radical nationalist, that's a dangerous word, nationalist, because whenever nationalism comes into it, you end up creating one group better than the other, and that's not God's plan, except in the church. That's the one nation under God. He was part of the job, a political party that was anti-Semitic. Well, the problem was, these, all these anti-Semitic people, he discovered that his great-grandparents were, or his grandparents were Jews. Here's the weird thing. His view of life and politics have changed. He's become an Orthodox Jew. He immigrated to Israel, and now he supports the people amongst whom he once hated. He lives amongst them. We don't find our identity in that. We find our identity in Christ. Now, Peter tells us who we are and who we're not. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Are you, are you with me? But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners, 
to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. This world's trying to shape you, it's trying to destroy you, but you've got a new identity because you're a child of God and you belong to the family of God. Are you with me? And it's so important to recognize that in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. We have a new humanity and a new identity because we are called Christians and we're in the family of God. Does that make sense to you? Here are 10 important things about establishing our true spiritual identity. Number one, know what God has said about our true identity. If you want to know someone's natural identity, you know what you usually ask them for is their ID document. It's a book that tells you, it used to be a little book with pages in, that tells you who they are, where they were born, what race group they're from, what gender they're from, and what nationality they are. Isn't that true? It's a document. Well, the Bible is your ID document. It tells you who you are now, that you are no longer divided up into race groups and categories, but we're all one in Christ, and we belong to God, and we're sons and daughters of the living God, saved by His grace on our way to heaven. That's who we are. And when you understand what the Word says about you, It'll give you confidence. When John the Baptist was approached by the Pharisees, they asked him, who are you? You just come here, you emerge from the wilderness. Who who do you think you are? They said, are you Elijah? No. Are you one of the prophets? No. Who are you? I'm the one of whom it is written in the ID document in the book of Isaiah. Make his way clear. You see, he knew where he was in the word. Do you know who you are from the word? Or are you struggling for an identity? You see, you've got to know it is written when the devil comes to you. That's what Jesus told the devil. When the devil came and tempted him, it is written. Not, don't you know who I am? It is written. And we're living in an identity jungle where we can't make sense of things. You've got to know I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter what all these people do and all these people are trying to be. I know who I am in Christ. I was reading a book just recently about a man and his family who motorcycle all over the world and they decided to motorcycle through Africa. And uh, they were in Central Africa in quite a jungle riding on like a dirt road, all of them. And they suddenly came into like a clearing, you know, like like a lawn almost, grass. And as they stopped and, you know, wondered where they were, and they noticed this table set with a cutlery and crockery and and a tablecloth and, and everything. And there were two people. The man had a waistcoat on with a white shirt and the, the woman had a long frock on. And they were like, huh? Is this a movie set or what? And they approached the people amazed and kind of like inquired, what's happening here? And the lady looked up and she said to the, the head of the family, she said, being in a jungle is no reason to forget who we are. Are you in such a jungle that you don't know where you are? You don't know who you are? You've lost your identity and you're clinging to physical things. See, Jesus, when he received that voice from the Father, he didn't just go into the synagogue and say to them, hey, I'm here. He was given the book of Isaiah the prophet and he began to read it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. And he read the written word and then said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He didn't go in there and say, hey, I just heard a voice. I'm here. He heard the voice, but he had the word. You and I need the revelation, but we need the word. What does God say about us? We need to hold on to that ID document. Number two, this is important about establishing your true identity. Looking inwards or outwards cannot create a sound identity. Looking inwards or looking outwards cannot create a sound identity. Some people are looking out to culture to see the voices of culture and to determine what culture is saying. Others are looking inside. Who am I? How do I feel? And so the authoritative voices of the word and the authoritative voices of parents have been diminished. People are now relying on feelings. They're even allowing children to tell you what they feel their gender is. No, wait, it gets worse. They can go and have an operation at four years old and the doctors don't have to tell the parents. We are living in an identity jungle. You need to train your children from young that they are children of God, that they walk alongside you in the family of God. Because this does not 
Listen to me today. This does not lead to freedom. This leads to bondage and to chaos and to heartbreak. And they keep telling you that people are committing suicide because they have sexual confusion. No, it's because of debauched living and confusion that suicide occurs. If you train up a child correctly and you serve the Lord, it can keep you from insanity. Paul writing to us describes our state. And you might not immediately recognize it, but this verse teaches us something important. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Now, just pause there. If you stopped there, you'd say, well, I didn't know, and I knew nothing. Now I know everything. But he doesn't stop there. He qualifies that even as an adult, there's things missing. He goes on to say, for now, we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part... Then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. You see, you don't know fully if you look inside. But if you look into your ID document and you look to the Lord, then suddenly you discover who you are. This is very, very important, especially for teenagers. Uh, social psychologist Eric Erickson, he studied teenagers and he says they've got a struggle. And that struggle that goes on in a teenager is, is role confusion versus identity. And he says that they experiment by wearing different clothing, and tattooing themselves, music. They want to be different to their parents to establish who they really are. And he says this, if a teenager does not walk away from their adolescence with a clear sense of who they are, they will never have a healthy personality. So if the world continues to confuse our children, we will have unhealthy adults. Because these are issues everyone's wrestling with and the church mustn't be dragged into confusion. We must know who we are. We are a different culture and a different society. Number three, only Jesus gives us our true identity. In today's world, we want the fruits of identity, but the roots of identity or true roots of identity only to be found in Christ. See, everyone's identity starts with a birth certificate, but the new birth gives you a new birth certificate. Isn't that true? And in fact, as you look at Jesus and follow Jesus, you become like him because he is your older brother, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 3, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord with Spirit. So we take our identity from Jesus as we look at him, we begin to reflect him. We become like him because he's our family. No matter what race we are, no matter what age we are, Jesus is our identity. Are you with me? He died for us and made us children of God. I struggle when I go on a Christian social media and they don't reflect being Christians. Someone tells me, I'm, I'm a Christian. I... I go to rivers. Oh, really? I've never, I've not met you. you know, I've been coming for 10 years. And I look at their social media. Shoes, bags, boobs, bums. <laughs> no, come on now. I surely must see something of a service. You should reflect who you belong to. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of positive ones here as we move along. Number four, new identity means a new destiny. See, because you have a new identity, you have a new destiny. When, when the Lord got hold of a, 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 a Abraham and Sarah, he changed their names. He didn't just change their names. He basically changed their destiny. He made them his people and then gave them his promises and his blessings. When, when the Lord got hold of Jacob, Jacob woke up and he discovered heaven. He had an encounter with heaven. It's like a picture of the Christian life. God changed his name from deceiver, Jacob, to Israel, prince with God. When Peter encountered Jesus, Jesus changed Peter's name, signifying you're not just some fisherman anymore. You're going to be one of the 12 apostles, and you're going to sit on the throne because identity equals destiny. We don't have the same destiny as other people. Can I encourage you when you go to family functions and parties, don't try and fit in. I often meet strange people here. Let me give an example. You're going to have your tires changed or, you know, the potholes in South Africa, ridiculous. So you go to the tire place. Hi, morning, I need X, Y, Z, the guy behind the counter. Yeah, no, struggling to get stock. The, 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 the F, the Y, the G, the, the B. Uh, do you then try and, yeah, yeah, no, South Africa, the F, the Y, the B. Or do you just go, yeah, it's pretty troubled in South Africa. 
See, some people try and fit in because they don't know the ident- I know my identity. And it's not just because I'm a pastor. I'm a child of God. I don't talk like that. And you know what happens? Your desperate attempt to fit in is worse because when you just keep quiet and you're just friendly, they kind of go, because they find it strange that you don't fit in. Why do you want to fit in? We're different. We're children of God. We follow Jesus. We're all from different backgrounds, but we're one body. (laughs) Number five, new identity means no bondage to culture. Don't have to act like the culture you come from. You can be a new creature. Are you with me? See, the world will try and mold you. Romans 12 says, don't be molded by your culture. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, so from now on, We regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Interesting, as you look at that phrase, new creation, or those words, new creation, do you know what they actually mean in the Greek? It means a new species. It's literally saying you once were a dog, now you're a bird. You're not just, you know, you once were here, now you're there. You once didn't go to church, now you go to church. No, no, no. You are a completely different person because you have come from your family of origin into the family of choice, which is the Christian family. There's no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, white nor black. Everyone is just... So why would we gravitate to culture to try and find race, to try and get identity or superiority? Now we leave all that behind. Now we're a new people. In 1972, Christians in Chad, in Africa, were persecuted because they were being forced to participate in old initiation rites um, that they said were pagan. And uh, uh, the government tortured Christian leaders and put them in prison, buried them alive with just their heads sticking out or their legs sticking out of the ground for a slow death. And uh, the reason was is these Christians reacted to the practices that were being foisted on them. They had to drink chicken blood, offered stuff to idols, they had to handle fetishes, tie things around them, different ceremonies, bones and stuff. And the president, Francois Tombalbaya, launched a cultural revolution because he wanted to rid the nation's people of foreign influences and establish an identity with the country's past. Now, on the surface of it, it sounds very good. But what actually was happening was he was part of a group of people. They were known as the Sara people. And not only did the Sara people practice this, but a subgroup of the Sara people. So he wanted the whole nation to embrace this. And he called, well, you're African, you must do it. Meanwhile, they're like a sub, sub people in a subgroup. Well, all the Christian churches rebelled in Chad and they protested against it. Some 1,500 evangelical churches. And some churches would not readmit members back into their church who had practiced these rites in trying to you know, satisfy culture. Eventually, it got so critical that his own soldiers um, murdered, um, murdered Tumbaya, uh, Tumbaya in 1975 and rebelled. Here's, here's my point. Cultural identity always divides. Spiritual identity always unites. And we've got to be careful. We're not seeing something and we think it's good, but it's actually dragging us back and dividing us when God wants to unite us. Am I making sense today? Number six, quickly, I've got a couple of minutes left. I've got to go quickly. New identity means coping with rejection well. See, when you have a new identity, you don't have to fit in. So if people reject you, you say, well, it doesn't matter. I know where I belong. I know who I am. I am who he says I am. Isn't that true? So people can laugh at you. They can talk behind your back. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I don't care what family says. I don't care what strangers say. Now, let me remind you what the Bible says about you and me as Christians. It says this in 1 Peter, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Watch this, a peculiar people. That means we don't try and fit in. Next time you go to a party or a family function, stand there and go, I'm peculiar. (laughs) I'm peculiar. They all swear, they all gossip, they all do this, they all do that. They're trying to drag me back to that. They ask me why I don't do this. They talk about the church I go to. Uh, I'm peculiar. Okay, that's done with. Let me go home. Let me go to church on Sunday morning. Praise God, I'm in the family of God again. Number seven, I've got to go quickly. New identity means new security. New security. 
See, when you know who you are, you can know that your life is hid with Christ in God, that you're on your way to heaven. Should anything happen in your life, God's got you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to direct you. And uh, you, no doubts or fears can rob us from that. Our feelings don't matter because we know that we know that we belong to Jesus. And you've got to hold on to that. It brings new security into your life. Listen, you don't just attend church. You're a new person. You're a new creation. Number eight, our new identity will always be challenged. I want to remind you, as a Christian, your identity will be challenged. You remember that Satan came to Jesus to challenge his identity. When was it? Not before his baptism, when he was still growing and figuring it out. After he made a full-on commitment, Satan came. And what did he say? If you are the son of God, challenge his identity. And the devil will do that to you. And by the way, Jesus was in the wilderness. The devil will always come to you when you're in a wilderness of sorts and ask you, if you are a born-again Christian who God cares for, how come you had an accident? If you are a born-again Christian who God cares for and you are the head and not the tail, how come you're going through such a trial? And we've got to stand up and say, it is written. It is written. It is written. It's not about how I feel. It is written. You see, that's the way. And your identity will be challenged. You've got to keep coming back to it is written, not some kind of other debate. I hope this is helping you today. And number nine, I'll go quickly. We're nearly done. True identity means we regain a sense of self in failure. See, we will fail as Christians, but if you know who you are, you can get up from failure and go on. You're not destroyed. You fail, but you're not a failure. Because you, you, that's not your identity. Failure is not your identity. You're a child of God who happened to fail. And you can get up and go back. You remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. He was a child of God. He had an identity. He left. He destroyed that identity. He squandered everything. But he could still at any point come to his senses, the Bible says. And he could get up and go back to his father. And he could repent and say, Father, I've lost sight of you. I'm not worthy to be called your son, he says. Make me one of your hired servants. And the father then says, no, you're actually my son, and I'm going to restore you because you repent. You see, you're not written off. You can regain a sense of self even in failure if you know who you are.